welcome everybody to this afternoon's uh, training open day. Um, we're going to be talking about the training contracts that the day will have available beginning in September 2022. Lee Day's offered training contracts now for over 25 years in um, giving experience in a variety of our departments. And uh, many of our for former trainees uh, are now partners um, and others are at different places in the firm. I'm going to be introducing to you a series of uh, speakers who will talk to you about their experiences as trainees and newly qualified staff. But first of all, I'm going to introduce our senior partner, Martin Day, who set up the firm with Sarah Lee some years ago. Martin, handing over to you now. Thank you very much indeed, Fran, and my welcome as well to uh, so many people uh, around the country and, and presumably also abroad. Um, when I, as Fran mentioned, I set up the firm back in 1987 with Sarah Lee, um, and there were just two of us based in a small little office in Gray's Inn Road in central London uh, with a couple of secretaries, so just the four of us who started the firm. And just amazing to think now that we are now uh, 500 people in the firm. Uh, we got not just our office in London, but also in Manchester, um, and that we have some 55 partners. And uh, people often have asked me, what is my ambition for the firm in terms of size? I've got, the answer is I've got no real ambition for the size of the firm. What we were set up to do and what we've always wanted to try and do is to be there for representing just ordinary people, whether this is in this country or, or or, or abroad uh, in bringing cases against uh, British multinationals, against British government in relation to actions that they've taken that have harmed those individuals. And we want, always wanted to be large enough that we could actually take on the might of uh, corporate Britain. And as I was thinking before I came on to give this speech about just what's been going on even over the last few weeks, uh, just to mention a few cases that we're involved in, that uh, on Friday we have the judgment coming out about equal pay. This is about the women in the checkout counters in your local stores, your Asda store, your Tesco store, your Morrison store, um, uh, that they are being paid, our cases that they're being paid less than the men who are in the uh, backroom stores, uh, which we say is totally wrong. And if we're right, then it would be a massive step forward for women in this country in terms of ensuring that they do get paid equal pay. Uh, and that judgment is out from the Supreme Court on Friday. So keep a good watchful eye on it. Um, uh, just uh, two or three weeks ago, we've been acting for uh, many of the drivers for Uber uh, who've been challenging Uber, who uh, have traditionally said that uh, Uber drivers are not employed or not working for them and that they should be uh, treated as self-employed people, which means they don't get their minimum wage, they don't get the um, pay that you get for holiday pay in a normal employed situation. Um, and uh, uh, we were successful again in the Supreme Court there and we hopefully will bring about a change for tens of thousands of Uber drivers' lives uh, to make sure they get their protections. Uh, we also act and lots to do a lot of work in the environment. We act for a group called Wild Justice, who's one of the main people of whom is Chris Packham, the famous uh, introducer in relation to the environment. And the environment team here, our legal team, have done a crack, fantastic job in supporting Wild Justice in trying to make sure that they're protecting the environment that we live in, not just for now, but for many years to come. Uh, we've had, we act for, you may be surprised here, we act for something like 15,000 police officers uh, throughout the country uh, who challenge the government when they try to bring a change to their pension regime. And we were successful in bringing about change to make sure that the police officers and indeed judges uh, could live in with a pension that they uh, were, were totally entitled to. But it's not just work in this country. We have teams who work a lot abroad. We have cases where we just, um, again, in the last few weeks, we successfully brought about a resolution of a case in Zambia on behalf of two and a half thousand people who'd been massively impacted by mining pollution. And we're able to get them good compensation 
that will hopefully change their lives. Uh, in that northern part of Zambia, we acted for uh, many thousands of people from Nigeria uh, in a couple of areas where there'd been oil spills uh, and uh, those communities uh, took uh, a case which ended up in the Supreme Court. Uh, again, we were successful in making sure that we could have the cases heard here in the UK. So we have cases all around the country, all around other countries, always representing ordinary individuals, always being on the side of the people, the ordinary man and woman in the street, uh, to try and take on the might of companies like Shell, like BP, like the British government that we did when we took on them in relation to the operations of the British army in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and we need good quality lawyers who are prepared to take those cases on and make sure that they are brought to absolutely the best of skills of uh, comparable to the skills if you were a multinational who'd go to one of the magic circle for firms in London. Uh, we want to make sure that the quality of the legal uh, work that they get, the ordinary person gets uh, from here at Lee Day. So I'm very proud of what Lee Day has been able to achieve over these 33 years of our existence. Uh, and I look forward to being able to see those successes carry on year after year and you know maybe well after I've retired if I ever do retire um, so I'm delighted to be made aware that there are so many hundreds of people who are listening or interested in the idea of coming to Lee Day uh, you will be our potential future um, and I very much hope that uh, uh, you find the day interesting and that many of you will apply to the firm for a training contract. Uh, I think it's a fantastic firm. I've loved being a part of it. And uh, uh, I wish you all the very best in your applications and your considerations. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I'll hand you back to Fran. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, Martin. That was a, a nice skip through some of the things that are happening at the moment and also a reminder of some of the past. Uh, I'm now going to hand you over to one of our former trainees, uh, Jean Matthews, who is now a partner in our human rights department. Now he will talk to you a bit about what makes a successful trainee and uh, how to make the most of the opportunity of being trained as a trainee at Lee Day. Jean. Thank you very much, Fran. Um, um, I just wanted to give a bit of information about myself. So, um, as Fran mentioned, I was a trainee at Lee Day. It was some time ago. I, I think it was in 2002 that I was a trainee, and I've been a partner since uh, 2010. Um, in terms of my training contract, I spent some time in our international department and also in the human rights department. So it was a, a, a quite a varied um training contract but uh, much, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed all of it actually. Um, I currently practice uh, uh, consumer law and data protection work usually in a group claim setting um, which is an area that I really uh, enjoy um, and as Fran mentioned um, I think it was suggested that I would speak today about what makes a good trainee. Um, it was a long time ago, as I just mentioned, but nevertheless, um, I thought about the people who I've had as trainees over the years and the attributes that made them stand out um, for me. And I, so I, I hope some of this is helpful to you. Um, I think number one is probably uh, a ded dedication to the job really at hand. So it's the ability to focus on the job that's before you uh, even if it isn't necessarily the most glamorous job, um, it's important to the overall picture and, and, and ultimately you're doing it because it's necessary for the, for the case and to progress the matter at hand. So that's one of my tips. Um, I think another uh, point that I would make is probably just understanding the importance of teamwork, um, particularly with group claims. We usually have quite a few fee earners and support staff helping us to take cases through. So it's the ability to work well with others and to, to um, make sure that uh, the, the, the lines of communication are always open. Um, 
I think Lee Day is a firm that you'll find is, is uh, very open and, and forthright in our views and our ability to communicate with each other is so important. And to develop those relationships as, as soon as you can is, is, is going to uh, really stand you in good stead for uh, the rest of your professional career. Um, I, I guess linked to that is the ability to take responsibility for uh, uh, the task uh, that you have in front of you. Uh, and, and not, to, not to, to say that you will be suddenly uh, landed with a, 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 an issue that is way above your pay grade. Um, you know, you work in a supportive environment where people will help. But uh, I think that ability to uh, take responsibility is one of the things that helps to uh, make a, a trainee stand out because you can see that that person has embraced the challenge and they see it as their task to, to, to see it right through to the end, really. Um, flexibility is another point I think is really important. You will be um, juggling lots of different and new responsibilities. And, uh, you know, sometimes things won't necessarily uh, uh, go in exactly the way that you planned, but it's your ability to actually recognize that and to work out uh, uh, the best strategy for going forward. So um, flexibility is quite an important um, uh, uh, attribute that you'll learn and develop. And I think it, again, will put you in good stead for the rest of your professional career. Um, I think the final point I wanted to mention was just in relation to resilience. Uh, I, I guess you might say, well, that feeds into flexibility, but um, resilience is a word we hear a lot of nowadays. Um, it's important in the professional setting as well. I think the ability to be able to bounce back from things uh, when they don't go the way that you intended and the ability to be able to um, identify uh, ways around difficult issues that might come up, um, really important. And uh, as I say, coupled with your um, excellent communication skills and, and your ability to work as a team, I'd expect that you, you, you will sell through your training contract and move on to, to be a successful solicitor. Um, I think on, on a final note from me, I wanted to uh, make reference to something that I've found in my own career, and that is to really just make the best of the opportunities that come up in front of you. And I was thinking really of an example in my own career, and I, I remember being given a rather dry research task to do um, in, a, in a rainy London office that involved um, looking at some statistics from a mining company. But that very boring task, that very, sorry, I shouldn't say that, but that very dry task then led on to an opportunity to travel out to South Africa and to be in the, 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 the uh, uh, South African mining authorities uh, offices and looking at documents there. So I guess the point of the, 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 the story is just to say, you never know where something's going to lead you and you know, absolutely throw yourself into it and uh, hopefully it will take you to somewhere that's interesting and, and new. So I think that's it from me and I'll just hand back to Fran, thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, now we're going to hear from a series of current trainees at uh, different, in different parts of the firm, um, all of whom have had slightly different experiences to date. We're going to start off with uh, Dan Webster, who's a trainee in our human rights team, uh, where he had worked for a while in any event. So his experience is um, of somebody who's been around for a bit and now taking on a trainee post. Dan, far away. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Fran. Um, yeah, so I'm going to speak a bit about the, um, the application process um, for a training contract at Lee Day and uh, preparing for the assessment day. Um, so as Fran said, I'm a trainee solicitor in the human rights department. Uh, I'm currently in my first seat um, and I initially joined the firm actually as an admin assistant in the uh, ClinNeg department uh, just over four years ago, um, shortly after graduating from university. Um, I became a paralegal in Clinic um, a few months later and, and gained some really helpful and interesting experience uh, in that department, including 
representing children who'd been left with very severe disabilities as a result of uh, injuries they'd suffered at birth. Um, uh, and I later joined the human rights department uh, as a paralegal. Um, uh, and I was uh, lucky at the third time of trying and applying for a training contract, which I started last uh, September. Um, and I've, I've remained in the same team within human rights for my first seat this year, um, where we do a wide range of work in my team, uh, uh, mainly in the context of health and social care, um, including representing bereaved families at inquests um, and acting for claimants in human rights and discrimination claims, uh, as well as representing individuals who lack capacity in uh, court of protection proceedings. Um, so moving on to the application process, um, there's essentially uh, two parts to it to, to tell you about. The first is uh, a written application which is submitted via an online portal. Um, and there's two, uh, two aspects to that that I wanted to touch on in particular. Um, the first is uh, the work experience section. Um, now, uh, the work experience that you will all have been able to gain so far will vary greatly um, uh, from those of you who've already got a wealth of experience to those who are still studying and maybe you haven't been blessed with the connections or financial circumstances to allow you to undertake loads of unpaid work experience but no matter where you lie on that spectrum um, I would say don't don't lose confidence um, the firm it, is not going to be looking for a checklist of experience from you but uh, very much at what you've got out of whatever work and life experiences you have um, so don't be afraid to include uh, any non-legal work experience that you've done um, whether it be working in retail or in catering, just as long as you can explain um, the skills that you've gained from that experience and, and how it helped to prepare you um, for work as a lead day trainee. Uh, and I think my fellow trainee, Abby, is going to say a few words shortly about her own uh, journey to lead day um, as an applicant who'd only recently graduated from, from university. Um, the other part of the uh, written application uh, I wanted to speak about as a covering letter um, and we can't be um, too prescriptive about what should go in the letter as it is um, largely up to you and a, a chance for you to explain in your own words uh, why you would like to, to train at Lee Day and why you think you're a suitable candidate. Um, but I can give some general guidance about two main aspects um, which are also relevant to the assessment day. Um, so the first thing I would suggest is, is to get to know Lee Day. Um, no one's expecting you when you apply to have an, an in-depth knowledge of the firm's work, um, but it's important that you show, uh, I think, an understanding of the firm's ethos and explain why you're attracted to it. Um, and uh, we've got a new website that's recently gone live and has a lot of uh, helpful resources on it to help you familiarise yourself with the firm, uh, our various departments and some examples of um, significant recent cases, as, as Martin um, touched on, and, the, and identify the areas that are of most interest to you. Um, the second aspect is about um, uh, about you and showing why you're a strong candidate for a, for a training contract at Lee Day. Um, and it can be tempting to list as many examples as you can of your work and your achievements, but um, I would recommend that you try to avoid providing just a checklist of your experience, because uh, what we'll be looking for um, is the application of what you've gained from your experience and how that relates to the skills that are required of a, of a trainee solicitor and to, to Lee Day's ethos. Um, then the second part of the application process um, is the assessment day, um, which consists of a written assessment um, and online reasoning tests uh, and two separate panel interviews, um, all of which I think will unfortunately have to be uh, done, on, done virtually this year. Um, applicants who are invited to the assessment day will be given uh, some more specific information about um, those assessments in advance. Um, but the interviews will be carried out by senior staff from various departments around the firm. Um, and, and my experience of the interview process was that the panels were really friendly and welcoming. Um, and the tone of the interviews was very much conversational, um, offering lots of opportunity to show your strengths, uh, skills and your affinity for Lee Day. Um, the questions you'll be asked are fairly typical competency questions, uh, as well as some legal or ethical scenario based questions related to the various areas of the firm's work. Um, if you've got any questions about the application process which aren't addressed today, um, you're welcome to direct those to um, our recruitment team by email um, at jobs at leeday.co.uk. Um, and just to wrap up, if I can give you one main takeaway that I think would help with your application, uh, it's to try to avoid going into the process with the idea that you're 
um, inferior to any other applicants or, or less deserving of a training contract based on, on the experience that you have so far. Um, it might um, sound silly, but I think uh, it's a big hurdle a lot of people have to overcome. So um, my message would be to keep your focus on what you, what you do have rather than what you don't and to believe in yourself, no matter what stage you're at um, or what your background is. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful and I'll hand back over to Fran. Thank you very much, Dan. I'm sure that was very helpful. And um, as Dan said, we are happy to answer questions, um, whether that's by your emailing in at a later stage or you'll all be familiar with using the Q&A button, which uh, you'll find at the top of your screen. Um, and we have someone behind the scenes who's putting together a series of questions. We're about halfway through the different um, talks now, so it's probably a good time for you to be thinking of the sort of things you want to ask about. And there will be an opportunity about 40 minutes at the end of uh, the sessions uh, for your questions to be answered. So you can put them to anybody you like um, and we'll ensure as many of them can be answered as possible. Now I'm going to hand over to another trainee who's had another sort of experience within the firm, uh, Chima, um, who will talk to you a little bit about the pathway to becoming a trainee. Thank you, Chima, fire away. Some IT issues, but I was just saying, uh, my name is Shima and I'm a first year trainee in the clinical negligence department. Uh, I just thought that I'd ask Targeti a little bit about uh, how I got to Lee Day. So um, I first heard about Lee Day when I was completing my law degree in France um, and as part of my international human rights course. I then moved to the UK to do a master's degree in European and international law where um, I got to learn a little bit more about Lee Day and had the opportunity to join the international department for what started as a summer job and then I just never left. I loved it. That's how much I loved it. I, uh, one of the big experiences or takeaways from my time and uh, when I first joined Lee Day was uh, being uh, sent on a plane to Nigeria on week one of joining uh, to work on one of the cases that uh, Martin mentioned earlier, uh, the Belay case um, that was recently at the Supreme Court. And um, international travel is uh, something that is quite important in the international department and is one of the absolute perks of the job. You don't only uh, get to go to places you never visit, but more importantly, you get to meet and help uh, vulnerable people that were affected by the action and activities of multinationals abroad that um, wouldn't get access to, just, ju to justice otherwise. Uh, I spent that summer um, traveling to various countries in Africa uh, in, in different uh, cases uh, the firm was running at the time. I, it took me a few years, um, just like Dan said, uh, before securing a training contract, but I knew there was no else I wanted to train. So I would say, if Lee Day is a good match for you, do not give up and, 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 and make sure you, you, um, you explain uh, doing your cover letter and the interview why, why that is so important for you uh, to, to train at Lee Day. I am currently uh, in the clinical negligence department for my first seat, uh, where we um, help individuals, patients or families as a result that were injured, injured or died as a result of um, negligent medical care. And uh, I thought I'll give you a few points or remarks that I've, I've noted from my experience as an internal candidate and um, switching to, to a trainee from a paralegal to a trainee. So the, the first point that I thought would be quite interesting is um, Lee Day has a quite unique structure for its a training contract. It's a 12 month seat in two different departments usually. And you would think that 12 months is a very long time and you'll have, you know, plenty of time to get through everything, but it actually flies by 
and I'm, I'm currently in my second half of my first seat and I feel that I've only joined the clean leg department a few weeks ago. So I would say try to make the most of it uh, from the very beginning because it does go by very quickly. The second point is that um, the training contract is really something that can be personalized and that you should be very proactive um, in terms of your training. And, and your supervisor will be aware of that as well. So on many occasions, my supervisor has asked me, um, what do you wanna do next? Is there anything else you would like to gain experience in? And I think that's very, very empowering to know that you, you can make the most, make what you want out of the training contract. So don't be afraid to be proactive. And my final point, is um, really about more generally about the ethos of the firm more generally and, and, and the people that work there. So before moving to the clinic department, I had built a network of friends and colleagues in the international department uh, for a few years. And I was a little bit apprehensive to move to a new department. But honestly, um, even during lockdown and working from home, I found that everyone was very friendly, approachable, and I managed to um, make friends and uh, build relationships really quickly. So that, that's something, uh, the friendly nature of, of the firm is really uh, something that goes through all the departments. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Uh, I, I will uh, hand over to Fran now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shima. Um, very interesting route that you've had to becoming a trainee and lots more experiences to have. Um, we've now got a, another uh, trainee to talk about current experience and um, how she's come to be there and what sort of things to expect in a training contract. Uh, and also, I think I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about whether or not the training contract has added up to your expectations, Abby. So um, handing over uh, to you. Hi, thanks, Fran. So, yeah, my name's Abby. I'm a trainee. I'm in my um, second year, so in my second seat, I'm currently in the human rights department in the prisons team. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about my experience as a trainee, but I thought I'd start by talking about my route into Lee Day, because as Dan mentioned, I came to Lee Day as a trainee, having not worked at Lee Day before or at any law firm before. So I studied law at university, graduated in 2017, and didn't really know what I wanted to do do after that except I wasn't interested in city law I wanted something a bit more fulfilling um, I spent a year then sort of working various temp work to raise money to do the LPC because that is expensive and I did manage to fit in a bit of volunteering at my local citizens advice and then while I was looking for sort of training contracts and paralegal jobs in that year I found lead day which stood out to me as somewhere I really wanted to work I luckily got the training contracts in so that was in the summer of 2018 so then I studied the LPC full-time from September 2018 and then started at the firm in September 2019. So when I was applying and then when I sort of started at the firm as a trainee I was a bit concerned about sort of having not had that experience working at Lee Day or working at any law firm at all before and also I hadn't done much voluntary work or anything because I hadn't really been in a financial position to do that with the LPC cost and everything but what I actually found certainly when I started was I, I don't feel I was at a disadvantage at, at all for that the induction process was really thorough and sort of caught me up with everything that somebody who'd worked at the firm before might already know and everyone at, in the firm is so sort of friendly and helpful that I didn't feel at all different for not having been at the firm before um, and don't feel at all like I'm like I was behind or anything and it was still very manageable beginning as a trainee um, and I also as a trainee realized that the sort of experiences I did have um, had taught me a lot of skills which are what has helped me as a trainee rather than sort of any legal knowledge that I was concerned about not having um, so Jean talks about some of the skills sort of that the trainees um, that a good trainee has but for me I think things that I realized I'd learned was um, things like managing clients and explaining information or having a difficult conversation with a client 
I'd developed that when I was volunteering at Citizens Advice, but also when, you know, when I've been working in retail, dealing with customers um, and things like managing my workload, planning ahead and sort of problem solving as you go. I developed those sorts of skills while I was a student, balancing my uni works and other commitments and in the various jobs I'd had. So I think that's something I'd say to think about for your applications, um, just because you might not, might not have worked in a law firm or at lead day, that doesn't mean you won't have the skills to succeed as a trainee. So just try and sort of reflect on the experience you have and um, where you might have developed the skills that you could bring to lead day as a trainee. And then, so my time actually as a trainee, as I said, I'm in my second seat. Um, Shaima mentioned how it's two seats and I was a bit worried coming in about how much variety there would be in the cases I'd work on um, with that two seat structure when a lot of firms have um, people rotating around four seats. But what I found is actually I've still had a huge variety of cases that I've been involved with and you get to sort of really get properly involved with the cases at lead day. So the teams work closely together and as a trainee you get to sort of keep up with the cases. I definitely not just given bits of work to do and then I kind of don't know what happens with that case anymore you have a sort of bigger picture of the whole team's cases so my first seat I was in personal injury working mostly on asbestos cases so usually mesothelioma which is a type of cancer that you can get after asbestos exposure um, and in that seat straight away I got loads of um, exposure to cases at all stages so from doing initial research trying to trace um, people's employers and sort of build their cases to things like negotiating a settlement and dealing with costs and I got to do things you know like drafting documents like instructions to experts or letters of claim and I also got lots of human contact too with clients and witnesses. Now I'm in the human rights department in the prisons team so which has a really varied sort of caseload again we deal with a lot of discrimination cases, um, inquest cases sometimes and sort of personal injury, clinical negligence type matters, just all the common factor is that all our clients are prisoners or it relates to when they were a prisoner. And again, I've been able to get involved in cases at all stages, been able to attend hearings, get really involved with the new inquiries we have in, how we deal with those. And having a year in, um, in a seat does mean I've actually been able to see cases really progress and um, see how they develop. And it, I think it's actually really helped me have a deeper understanding of the um, kind of tactical process of running a case and the problems that can come up. Um, and then one thing I was sort of hoping I'd found in Lee Day and definitely think I have found as a trainee is how rewarding the work is. That was sort of what stood out to me when I was looking for training contracts is how rewarding the sorts of cases that Lee Day worked on seemed to be. And I think you definitely feel it in the day-to-day -day work at Lee Day. Um, so you know, Lido works on some really impressive cases. Martin talked about um, a few of them at the start. It doesn't mean I think that every single case you work on every single day is groundbreaking, but it is really rewarding because as a claimant only firm, in every case you do have a real feeling that you're sort of on the right side and you're helping somebody who really needs that legal help. Um, and the firm, I think there's a real sense that they really care about their clients. They don't just care about the legal case, but they care about the people who are sort of in the situations where they need our help. And then as a trainee, you get loads of contact with people, be it clients, witnesses, barristers, which is really good for training, but for me, a really rewarding part of the job. For example, being able to reassure a client or help produce a good witness statement and sort of, you feel that you've really contributed to the outcomes that we get for our clients. Um, and then the last thing I was gonna talk about was sort of what actually, training would be like as a trainee because especially not having worked at a law firm I had no idea really what it would involve being a trainee. Um, I think the training at Lee Day is really good. I have a lot of involvement with my supervisor. They definitely really pay attention to their trainees. They've been really friendly and approachable and they are sort of paying attention to your training. Um, I've always had really good feedback to be able to develop and improve tasks and my supervisor is always available for questions. Definitely as a trainer, I think you're sort of trusted to manage your workload. You're not micromanaged in every task you do, but it's always been very easy for me if I've ever had to say I've got too much work or if something's too difficult or if I need more work. And also I found the supervisors always very receptive to my comments or feedback. Um, as Shaman mentioned, sort of if there's something I feel like I need to get more experience in or something I want to get involved with, 
something I want to have a go at like a document drafting or something like that they'll always listen to that and help you kind of get the most out of your training contract and that goes sort of beyond your supervisor as well I think there's a lot of support from sort of everybody in the firm even sort of outside your team everybody is really friendly and really supportive um, there's a sort of real community feeling at the firm which makes it great to work day to day but I also think it's really great for training because you can speak to sort of so many people and work with so many different people and that's actually I think translated through COVID really well into remote working I had about six months in the firm before we all moved to remote working but there's still that sort of real feel feeling of support and a sort of firm community um, I think that's everything from me so I'll pass back over to Fran now thank you thank you very much Abby um, okay so we've heard from three trainees at different stages in their contract and we've got one more to go uh, Philippa Wheeler who's in our Clin Neg department She's going to talk about something a little bit different now, the, the culture of the firm that she's experienced, um, work-life balance that's expected at Lee Day, what you can do, and also a little bit about our social life and the sort of events that we might put on in the year. Uh, Philippa, over to you. Uh, hi, Fran. Um, thanks for that. Yes, my name's Philippa. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a trainee solicitor in the clinical negligence department. Um, by way of brief background, um, before I joined Lee Day, I was a mental health law paralegal. And then I joined as a clinical negligence paralegal, um, a role I was in for two years um, before I got my training contract. Um, so I've got a bit of a fun thing to talk about the culture of Lee Day today. Um, and it's obviously going to be a sort of two part story because the, the culture is so different in the office and outside of the office, although I think through the COVID pandemic, we've been able to maintain quite a lot of that. Um, so I think the main thing about the Lee Day culture is that you work in tight knit teams within departments who are all really friendly and approachable and also everybody within the firm. Um, there's a lot of firm wide events, um, which means that you get to meet people from different departments, which is really interesting, um, especially as when you're sort of physically in the office, you can only you only really see the people who are on your floor. So um, uh, the work life balance at Lee Day is, is very good. I think we're a very opportunistic firm. It means that if there's something that needs to be done, people stay and do it. But you're not going to see people there at you know, eight, nine, 10, most evenings. Um, there's been occasions that I've been in the office late until say seven, and my supervisor has walked past and said, why are you still here? Um, so I think it's very much, you know, everyone's got to have that drive to get things done, um, but there's not this, um, you know, there's not a requirement for you to be in the office for all of the time and people understand there's a work-life balance. Um, there's a lot of social activities in the firm. So when we're in the office and we're able to see people, we have regular socials, firm-wide socials every week called Friday night drinks. Um, and that's something we've continued through the COVID pandemic um, with Teams calls and Spotify playlists. And we've all been able to still sort of catch up. And that's been a really nice thing um, during this time. Um, we also have things such as a, there's a choir, um, which has continued virtually, netball teams, football teams, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, we do a lot of work for British Cycling and British Triathlon with cycling claims. Um, so there's a lot of you know lawyers and staff in the in the firm who are keen cyclists, and you know you often see have good chats at the bike racks. Um, and also the firm's got a cycle to work scheme, which is great. Um, we've also got several book clubs, um, and that sort of feeds into the committees that we've got at the firm. So Lee Day really keen to sort of improve, improve diversity within the firm and the legal profession. Um, so we've got a women's committee and recently made a commitment to the Law Society's Women in Law Pledge. Um, we've got a BAME committee, a disability committee, a green committee, and an LGBT plus and allies committee, um, which I'm going to plug slightly as a member of. And that was something I was able to do at Lee Day um, as sort of a junior member of staff was to join that committee. Um, and it does mean that we are a Stonewall top 100 employer and we've been recognized for our as an employer of trans people. Um, 
So also at Lee Day, we do a lot of fundraising. Um, when we're in the office, there are an awful lot of bake sales. It's really not great for any sort of diet you might be on, um, but there are some fabulous bakers. It feels like every week there's a bake sale. I sometimes try to add to it unsuccessfully sometimes with, you know, some people make the most beautiful cakes, but we have a lot of charity partners and it's a really great way to support them as well as some of the bigger events we do, such as marathons. Um, and we support charity partners that um, are to do with our work, such as the Spinal Injuries Association and Birth Rights and Cerebra and the Child Brain Injury Trust. There's also a lot of events that we've tried to host um, throughout the pandemic and before. Um, I don't know if any of you would have watched the Women's Rights in Healthcare events that the Clinical Negligence Department have put on. Um, they're available on our YouTube and I, I would recommend a watch. They're discussing some really great um, issues about women's rights in healthcare. We've also had webinars from the international department on um, topics such as ecocide. Um, and it's been really sort of, they're fascinating to show the breadth of work that Lee Day do, but also the range of issues that we're involved in. Um, before the pandemic, we used to do a lot of events in person and do talks. Um, and there's lots of sort of external and internal events. And you're really encouraged to go to all of the events that you can do. Um, as a trainee in the firm. I know that I attend quite a lot of events with the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers and the firm are really supportive of that. Um, and then sort of just to round off, one really lovely thing that we're about to have is we're about to move to a new office that's just down the road from our current office, which is all going to be open plan. Um, and it's, it's very lovely. I actually went to see it last week and I think it's just going to really um, improve the culture in the firm. We're going to be able to see people a lot more. It's, um, and uh, I think it will just be really great when we can finally get back in the office. Um, so thank you. That's all I had. And I'll hand back to Fran. Thank you very much, Philippa. And, and thank you to Dan Scheimer. Uh, and Abby as well, all four of you currently trainees here, and I hope everybody's got a bit of an idea uh, from the four of you, something of your experiences to date. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Aisha, who is uh, a newly qualified solicitor, been a trainee here and uh, moved into our employment team on qualification. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about the move from being a trainee to uh, becoming newly qualified and starting uh, a solicitor role within Lee Day. Aisha. Thanks, Fran. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Fran said, I'm Aisha and I'm a newly qualified solicitor in the um, employment department, having qualified in September 2020. Um, I completed seats in clinical negligence and employment. Um, during my training contract, I saw real value completing two year long seats as it enabled me to fully grasp the practice areas, um, develop my skill set, and build productive and efficient relationships with the clients whose claims I worked on. So, when I qualified on 14th of September, the most common question I was asked by friends, families, and colleagues is How do you feel? Does it feel any different now that you're qualified? I think I struggled to come up with a response to that question, mainly because at 23.59 on 13th of September, I was a trainee solicitor and 10 a.m. when my practicing certificate came through on 14th of September, I was a solicitor. Um, my first thought, apart from the sense of achievement that I'd finally made it, was surely I wasn't expected to magic this whole new skill set, confidence, and knowledge required for my new title, new email signature, and most importantly, my LinkedIn profile update. Whilst this isn't the case, I don't think it's entirely correct to say that my role as an NQ is the same as it was this time last year, when I gave a talk at our trainee open day halfway through my second seat in employment. As touched upon by Abby, um, as a trainee, you do get quite a lot of responsibility during your training contract at Lee Day. So the transition to a, um, a qualified lawyer is more of a gradual process rather than a big jump. Um, throughout my training contract, I worked very closely with my supervisors and really got stuck into the cases, which I definitely think helped me prepare for my role as an NQ. Um, what's also eased the transition is the training programme provided to NQs, which has been really helpful in developing our understanding of what's expected of us now that we're qualified. Um, and provided some useful insight into key areas 
outside of casework, including finances, ethics, and developing a social media presence and so on. Um, as a newly qualified, I've been able to develop and broaden my expertise in employment law. Um, I continue to work on high profile group litigation, as well as taking on individual clients on a number of issues such as dismissals, redundancies and discrimination in the workplace. The variety of work is really important to me and it's definitely something I've been able to communicate as a newly qualified solicitor. I've been able to develop autonomous autonomously as a lawyer, which I think um, is a key challenge for newly qualified and junior solicitors who have to grapple with finding a new place in their new team outside of a uh, structured trainee role. Um, naturally, expectations of me, self-imposed or otherwise, have grown. Um, I'm sure other NQs will agree with me that it's about gaining the confidence to make judgment calls whilst getting the balance right about when to seek guidance from um, supervisors and more knowledgeable colleagues. Um, that's definitely been my experience so far. Um, I've been afforded time to learn through doing um, with support and encouragement from my ever approachable supervisor um, who's ready to offer training and guidance when I need it. Um, on a more general level, um, I've had the opportunity to get involved and engage with issues I'm passionate about. Uh, Philippa touched upon the great committees that we have at Lee Day and I wish I could join them all. But I personally, I regularly write for the BAME newsletter and we've published really engaging articles and examples include a Black Lives Matter edition, Islamophobia and the disproportionate impact of COVID on the BAME community. Um, as a solicitor, I think it's really important to invest some time into other interests and passions outside your legal casework. Um, it's important in being able to build a personal brand and raise a profile for yourself. So for me, diversity and equality is really important and it's one of the key reasons I wanted to qualify into employment law. I feel really happy that I'm able to use my role and voice to push for meaningful change. Um, since qualifying, I've worked on the Employment Lawyers Association's response to the government's call for evidence on race um, and ethnic disparities in the UK. I'm also part of their Race Equality Committee and we're currently working on a number of exciting but well needed initiatives to increase diversity and inclusion in the profession. An unintended but important consequence of this is that I've been able to widen my network, which is crucial for a role as a junior, junior solicitor. Um, going back to Lee Day, just to conclude, um, I just want to mention that having undertaken a paralegal role, my training contract, and now a newly qualified position, I can very much say that it's a really great place to work. It's very collegiate and presents exciting opportunities to get involved in really meaningful and landscape changing work. I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, we're now going to hear from Hitasha. Uh, who's been qualified for a few years. So she will give you a sort of a bit of a bird's eye view of what it's like when you've finished your training contract and you've been an assistant solicitor in, in a department for a little while, uh, looking back down the telescope perhaps at, at how you've grown during that time. Thank you, Hitasha. Thanks, Fran. Hi, everyone. So as Fran said, I am a solicitor in the personal injury and um, industrial disease team. I trained at Lee Day and qualified in 2018, so I'm just over two years qualified. I'm going to talk a little bit about the transition from a trainee to a solicitor and also um, how my role has developed over the past couple of years. So just to begin with, I joined the firm in 2013, so some time ago now. Um, I joined on a work experience placement that I managed to secure through a mentoring scheme on the legal practice course. I then obtained a paralegal role, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I did for a good few years before I secured my training contract at the firm. As part of my training contract, I did my first seat in the clinical negligence department and my second in personal injury and the industrial disease team where I am today. In terms of the transition from a trainee to a qualified solicitor, it's uh, certainly exciting, but can also be a little bit daunting. Um, if you're staying at the firm that you trained with and also qualify into the department of your second seat as I did, it may not initially feel as though much has changed on your first day as an NQ, as Aisha said. 
but it certainly is the, the subtle things that are different and the expectations that are placed on you gradually shift. You are expected to take on greater responsibility without that constant supervision, but your role certainly doesn't change overnight. As an NQ, the firm provided a lot of support with tools and information to help the transition into your qualified roles. We had training sessions, I remember, from all sorts of topics ranging from how to be assertive to legal research and time management and growing our own um, external profile. So really helpful topics to guide you through that next stage of your career. Um, I, when I qualified, I also had um, support from my supervisor and I had discussions about what's expected of me, how my role would develop and how these changes were to be implemented practically in my workload. So an example of this is you know, moving from a more observation role in a meeting where perhaps you're just taking a note to actually taking part in the meeting and interviewing a client or witness. When I qualified, we also had um, internal training sessions from all of the senior fee earners in the department on different, different topics, which is also really useful and a good recap to the work if you are new or perhaps rejoining the department. So moving on to how my role then has developed over the last couple of years, um, one of the biggest changes that I certainly have noticed is that instead of just being allocated standalone tasks on a, on a case, you begin to work on all stages of a claim from investigation right through to settlement and costs. You're given the opportunity to take initiative, develop that independent thought and think ahead as to what further steps need to be taken in order to advance the case. Personally, I now have experience of interviewing clients and witnesses, being the lead solicitor in a conference and preparing for and attending court hearings and advising the client thereafter. As with anything, the more time you spend working in an area, the more familiar you become with the work and ultimately the less supervision you require. Um, I now have a, a small caselet of my own, which I thoroughly enjoy working on. I, of course, work on these cases under supervision and I have regular weekly catch-ups with my supervisor to discuss matters on those cases, but I do undertake the day-to-day -day work and I have the daily contact with the clients, which, which is really nice. And, Having that contact has taught me how to deal sensitively with clients and in the area that I work in, those clients are people who are terminally ill or perhaps widows who have lost their husbands or other family members that have been impacted by exposure to asbestos. Now, just generally, obviously, with more responsibility, there is, there is some pressure and there will be things that you are doing for the first time as a solicitor and devising your own solutions to problems instead of relying on others for that can at times be challenging and can result in things taking a little bit longer. But I think something I've learned is that that's part of the learning process and there's no need to go at it alone. It's fine to ask for guidance or run something by your supervisor if you're not sure on something. Everyone's really friendly and, you know, when we were in the office, I would often just pop into a colleague's room or pick up the phone and just run through a query that I had, which is always really helpful. And it's just great to learn and share from one another like that. So finally, just my tips then um, for, as a trainee and, and an NQ is that I would say ask as many questions that you have um, when you're not sure on things and don't be afraid to put yourself forward. You're not expected to know everything. Um, like my, co my colleagues have said beforehand, get involved in as many things as you can, even if it's not directly linked to the practice area that you want to specialise in. It's really good just to connect with people from other departments and learn new things. And uh, we've touched on the committees beforehand, but personally, I'm part of the BAME Book Club and also the Women's Committee as well. And that gives me an opportunity to do liaise and just meet with colleagues from all different departments. As a trainee and an NQ, I'd also say it's really important to keep up to date with industry developments and um, attend as many events as possible, which is also a good way to network and build your own profile. For me, I, I have really enjoyed my post-qualification experience at the firm, as I did with my paralegal experience. Um, I've certainly felt supported by the firm along the way. And I think the important thing to remember is that when you do qualify, the learning doesn't stop. And that's one of the best parts because you continue to grow and develop. Um, and I think that's all for me and just wish to wish you all the best of luck with your applications. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Itasha. I think we're now going to return to a screen with everybody on. We've been getting a lot of uh, Q&A. Um, I'm sure I'll be told if that's wrong, but please do put plenty of questions into the Q&A. Um, I've got more questions here to be answered than um, I think we'll get through to be answered orally. So um, at the end, if any of your questions haven't been answered, we'll be able to answer them by email. What I'm going to do is uh, some of the questions are specific to in individuals, and I will um, ask those if, if that's been put in that way. But otherwise, I'll just throw open to those of us who've been able to rejoin uh, some of the particular questions that have been asked. So um, would anyone like, perhaps Aisha, because uh, you're qualified now, um, we have a question about the type of work between departments. So can the type of work vary for trainees between different departments? And um, can you give some examples of the sort of different things that you were asked to do in the different departments you were in? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Um, I would say that the type of work um, that you undertake can vary even within, within a department. So currently, I'm in employment and I trained in employment and I worked on a group litigation. So acting on behalf of judges and I worked, um, yeah, our client base was about 250 judges. Um, on that claim, I was given quite a lot of responsibility, but I did work with a partner and a, another junior solicitor and an associate. Um, so, compared with Clinegg, where I worked with one partner on an individual client's claim, the work did vary in that I was given slightly more responsibility um, in clinical negligence. But that's not to say, like, I attended conferences, I did draft responses to clients, judge clients who were very um, scary, if I can say that. Um, but yeah, so I think it, it, it does really vary, but I'll have other colleagues in employment who work predominantly on individual cases. Um, and they, I don't know, I would say that they get to see a case through more quickly than you would if you were in a group litigation, because group litigation can take quite a long time um, um, in the courts because they are frequently appealed all the way up until the Supreme Court. Um, in terms of the work that I was given in clinical negligence, it was very much as Hatasha mentioned, investigation work, research, um, meeting with clients, interviewing clients, drafting witness statements, schedule of losses, attending conferences. Um, I would say speaking to a lot of the trainees and NQs, um, the work that you are provided is very good quality. Um, and to be honest, um, Comparing myself with an NQ or one year PQE qualified in my team in clinical negligence, I was given quite similar work to the already qualified solicitors. So it, they do want you to, to get fully involved from the outset, I would say. Um, yeah, that would, I would say that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Now, a question for Jean. Uh, you've been asked, what's the most challenging human rights case that you've had to work on since you joined the firm? I'll just unmute myself. I'm sorry about that. That's my usual party trick. Um, in terms of the most challenging case, uh, perhaps when we were representing a group of um, Kenyans, and we were investigating uh, allegations of, of systematic rape by members of the uh, uh, Ministry of Defence uh, that occurred in Kenya. They, those were some of the most challenging cases that I have been involved in. Um, obviously, an incredibly delicate issue and um, a number of people who were quite uh, seriously impacted, as you would expect. Um, so needing to just carefully navigate those issues and to be able to take uh, evidence from individuals who had been raped. Um, I'd probably put that at the top. 
Very serious stuff. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean. That must have been difficult. Um, so one of the groups of questions, quite a number of people have asked us about um, how have things gone during the past year of the pandemic? Uh, what has the firm done to ensure everybody's well-being? Um, and uh, at the same time, how have you all kept working? So uh, I'm just going to choose one of you to answer that. And if, perhaps if anyone else has got things to add, um, can I ask Shima to give us her view on that, please? Hi, thanks, Brian. Uh, so yeah, the last year has been very challenging for everyone across all sectors, as as you must uh, know. But the firm, the firm has been great in 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 really trying to 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 preempt what what would happen and try to, to put in place um, ways to 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 make the the show go on, as you say. Uh, so we uh, started working from home very early on. Um, I was actually doing my LPC during the uh, the, the first lockdown, but uh, many of my colleagues have uh, have uh, reported to me that the, the firm had had put in place um, let's try a working from home day, and that ended up being the first day of the whole working from home, and we've been working from home ever since. And the the IT department has been great, has been really uh, up to the challenge, helping everyone getting up to speed with the technology and we've had uh, many different um, yeah, IT tools like Teams that we use on a daily basis for meetings but also to chat with colleagues so that, that, that has been great and in terms of, of communicating with clients we've managed to, to um, maintain a good level of communication through again either over the phone or video calls with clients and trying to minimize any um, physical contact, obviously, uh, due to the pandemic. But overall, uh, yeah, the firm ha has, been, has been really up to the challenge and put in place so many different ways for us not only to continue working efficiently, but also to continue socialising. So that, that has been great. Thank you, Shima. Does anyone want to add to that from their experience? Mm, I would just probably add that I think one of the things I've found really helpful as well since we've been working from home is having that regular close contact with um, our team so with our team um, by example we have weekly catch-up meetings with our wider team and a lot of that isn't just focused on work itself but it's just generally a catch-up and just checking in and everyone making sure everyone's all right um, and just keeping the morale going so I think that's been really helpful um, yeah and that's that's all I wanted to add. Oh, thank you, Natasha. Um, so question for Dan now, actually. Um, they want to know what was different on your third try getting a training contract to the first couple? Um, did you do something different or was it your mindset or far away? Um, well, I'm quite a big believer in third time lucky generally, but I think, um, yeah, it was probably, there was probably a bit more to it than that. So um, obviously I think, um, yeah, I, over the years, my understanding of, of the firm improved uh, and what, what they were looking for in terms of applications. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I, I developed a clearer idea of, uh, of what my areas of interest were. Um, and I think, yeah, I was hopefully yeah, able to communicate that a bit more. Um, clearly and uh, effectively in my in my application the third time around, but um, yeah, I think I guess the main message is um, yeah. I mean, hopefully it won't take everyone three times, but um, but the main message is don't get too disheartened if um, if you don't immediately succeed because there is definitely um, yeah there's a a pathway there if you uh, if you stick at it and persevere. Um, and I you know I think there's also a lot to be said for um, having a shot at um, paralegal positions and, and admin positions within the firm if that's something you're interested in because um, it's something I benefited from uh, hugely like a lot of the other um, people who've spoken yeah oh, well it's great that you got through the time um, Jean can I ask you to talk a little bit about what the firm's plans are for flexible working and remote working in the future Yes, yeah, very happy to um, do that, Fran. Um, 
In terms of uh, the impact of COVID, obviously it's been significant. And I think it's probably fair to say that from a working perspective, we can't see ourselves going back to being in the position of being in the office five days a week in the way that many of us did before. And I, I, I certainly feel like that as well. But in terms of the discussions between the partners, we have decided that we would like to uh, operate on the basis of uh, 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 three days in the office, two days away as, as our starting point, really. And I think that that's to reflect the fact that working practices have changed. And um, generally speaking, I think that's a position that has been welcomed by um, the firm, um, by, by, by uh, the different teams. And um, I'm certainly looking forward to that. And, and, and as somebody mentioned earlier, we'll be moving into a new office as well. So those, those days that we are in the office, it will be much better than our current building, which if you've ever been to, you'll recognize, although I've got a lot of very, very fond memories of that building, um, it is um, slightly past its sell by date, I think it's fair to say. Yes, so well, thank you, Jean. Yes, I think it probably is much on its last legs. We've been here since 1996 and we've made the best of the building. Uh, it's time to move on now, I think. Um, so a question has been asked about uh, the sort of involvement that trainees have with clients and what responsibility you have in individual cases. Uh, Abby, I wonder if you could bring us up to date on what it's like for you in terms of client contact. Yeah, thanks, Fran. Um, I think it's something that I, client contact is definitely something I've enjoyed about the job. You definitely do get some of it um, from the start. I think it, I felt it sort of progressed a little bit as I've progressed through my training contract. So when I started um, in personal injury on the um, asbestos cases, um, I didn't have, I had some contact with clients, but sort of generally around smaller issues, you know, it might just be, you know, checking they've sort of got a letter and getting some financial information from them or something like that, and was maybe a bit more actively involved with um, speaking to witnesses, and I wouldn't necessarily take their initial statement, but I might speak to them to iron out a few of the finer details and things like that. Um, and then as it's as I sort of progress through, I think I've gotten a little bit more involved with the clients on sort of bigger issues. Um, you know, you'd also get the opportunity to like sit in on um, and take a note on meetings where you're taking like a witness statement, for example. And then um, now in my second seat, I'm probably at the point where I'm getting much more sort of um, responsibility with contacting clients to kind of explain something to them update them on something a bit more significant and it's it's definitely something I think you have to take quite seriously when you do it because it's um, you can be explaining things that are quite significant about their case to them but um, I think supervisors are always very good at sort of making sure they never give you something to do to speak to a client where you're out of your depth but making sure you do kind of build that experience so you don't end up qualifying and then that's the first time you ever speak to a client directly you do get that involvement with them whilst you're a trainee as well okay thank you very much abby i wonder philippa you're in a different department so maybe you have a different experience from clinical negligence i don't know give us an idea i think it's it's very similar in in some respects to abby's role but um it is we do get quite a lot of client contact in clinical negligence um I, we deal with, you know, individual claimants. Another thing that we do as trainees and as um, the, some of the more senior paralegals do is we take the new client inquiry calls. Um, so that's, you know, really client heavy um, for certain days. We're on a rotor, um, uh, but the, it can be quite sort of hard at times, but the firm's been really supportive. We've had training from the Samaritans, et cetera. Um, but I, we, you do get to go to conferences with council, you do get to liaise with council, be in on meetings and I, the supervisors are always really keen to let you go to things and improve on things that you want to. So if you say, I'd really like to go and attend this particular hearing with the client, then they're normally quite receptive to that. Um, and especially if there's something going on in the department, um, I know that in clinical negligence you don't have many trials um, and there was a big trial last year and we were sort of all encouraged to go down for a day to see it actually happening. Um, so yeah. 
Thank you, Philippa. Um, you touched then on having training from the Samaritans, which, which may have been something um, our 700 listeners may, may have wondered what it is that that means really. But I think just to explain it a bit further, we do try to look after the mental well-being of our staff if we can. Um, it does depend on being notified that people might need some input. And it's not so much that the Samaritans are here all the time, but quite a lot of the cases that the firm take on, whether that's uh, cases of abuse, I mean, Jean mentioned rape cases, but there are um, cases where children have been abused and are now adults. There are cases in clinical negligence where the effects on the family being quite extreme if there have been deaths by by um, mist mistake um, and, and we have brought in at different times different sorts of teams uh, including the Samaritans to just give a little bit of training on how to become resilient which is something I think G mentioned as well that um, we try to make sure that carrying the weight of, of other people's difficulties isn't something that becomes too overwhelming and particularly perhaps in those early years when you're getting used to talking um, I hope all my panel members have had that sort of access if they've needed to, but it's certainly something that's available through our uh, human resources team. And uh, we would encourage always people to bring it up with their supervisors if they feel uh, too much weight that they're carrying. There's a few questions which I think it's, um, which I can answer, and they're, they're sort of very straightforward questions before I go on to ask for some more opinions from, from our panel. Um, we've been asked what is the retention rate of our trainee solicitors once we um, have recruited you as trainees. It's between 85 and 90 percent over a five year period. Uh, usually at some stage or other in, in one or other of two years, somebody decides that although they've enjoyed the training contract, they want to go and work somewhere else. Or uh, I think you know, we lost somebody once to become a milliner. They wanted to make hats. So, you know, things do change uh, during the course of a trainee uh, post, but um, for, for the most part, trainees do get kept on. It does, of course, depend on the needs of the practice at the time, but it's, uh, so not, not everybody can always stay, but it's pretty commonplace and, and about 90%. Um, the question is about assignment of seats as well, if you're only in two seats. Um, so for the first year, when you first arrive, you're put in a seat by the recruiting team. You don't have an opportunity to choose where you go. But for your second year, opportunities are given. You have to put your first, second and third choice for your second year. And we try very hard indeed to ensure that you get one of those. Not everybody will get their first choice. Um, but there are six different choices and you do almost always get one of one of those. Um, we've been asked how many people apply for training contracts. Well, over the last few years, it's been about 500 applications. Um, I don't know whether it would be different this year because we've had the COVID year and there have been fewer training contracts available. So maybe more people are looking. But as a rule, we have 500 to look through. Um, we've also uh, been asked about um, how much we accommodate people who have uh, learning differences like dyslexia. And um, we always encourage people to apply, but you must make it clear on your application form if you've got a learning difference that you want to be taken into account at the time that you apply so that notice can be taken of it and whatever adjustments need to be made to ensure that you sit alongside everybody else equally. Um, so though, if you apply to us, there is somewhere on the form that you can set out what your learning difference is and then um, accommodation would be made during the application process. And if you join us as a trainee, then accommodation can be made uh, when you're actually in post. So I'm gonna return now to our panel. Um, I think there's a, there's a general question as Jean was asked, a general question for uh, trainees or, or the qualified uh, team as to what is the very most interesting case uh, that you've worked on. Perhaps we could have two or three of you 
volunteering to answer that and we could get a range of cases. Who would like to start? Well, I shall just pick someone then. Aisha, far away. Um, I think I'm going to go with um, the judges' pensions case I worked on. Um, saying judges' pensions probably doesn't sound particularly interesting, um, but basically in that claim, um, we brought um, on behalf of, as I said earlier, 250 judges for age discrimination and indirect discrimination in relation to pension changes in 2015. Um, so the government in kind of a cost saving exercise moved younger judges um, into a less favorable pension scheme and let the older judges stay in the older more favorable scheme we were successful and that that was appealed all the way to the court of appeal who um, and they rejected the appeal to the supreme court the reason why i say it's really really interesting is because of the impact that it's had in relation to um public sector pensions generally um so this um, successful judgment has been applied to teachers pensions doctors doctors pensions police pensions who and who were all affected by the discriminatory changes so i just think the impact has been really really huge um, and it just kind of indicates you know the landmark case claims that we work on at the day and the impact that yeah that they do have so i would say yes the judges pensions claim thank you anyone else like to give their most interesting case yeah um uh, so one of the most interesting cases I've worked on so far is on the Iraqi litigation, and, and that was um, uh, cases brought by Iraqi civilians for uh, against the British government, the British army, for the treatment they received following the um, Iraq war and the years after that, up until 2009-2010. And for me, it was extremely interesting because um, human rights in general are quite difficult to, 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 um, to respect or abide by in a, in a normal setting. But during war, at wartime, it's even more difficult. And, and you would think that, um, that there's nothing that anyone can do about it because it is wartime. That's that's the government's approach or, or response to that. But no, there's still there's still fundamental rights that need to be respected and abide by. And 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 that that entire litigation I think was extremely important uh, in terms of how we conduct wars all around the globe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to contribute or shall we move on? have a case as well, Fran. So okay. this, is, um, this is one of the mesothelioma cases that um, I have assisted on and it's terribly sad. It concerns a, a young doctor who was um, exposed during the work in the hospital. Um, the case was disputed, liability was disputed from the outset. And, you know, the, it involved, uh, this is one that Abby actually worked, worked on with me and it involved reviewing those documents that were lever arch files full um, and ultimately we were successful and although you know it doesn't change her circumstances and you know, she's got two young children and it's, it's very very sad but she you know she knows that her family will be looked after after and as well it brings about you know awareness of the dangers of asbestos in hospitals and schools and so on so that was I think a case that will stay with me. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we've been asked what made you choose Lee Day? And I'm actually going to start with Gene here, ask him to think back as to what made him choose Lee Day and whether he thinks what he thought then would still apply now. Thank, thank you, Fran. Um, that is a good question. And, and as you say, I mean, it was 20 years ago, so it was a while ago. But um, I, had, uh, I had been working um, before I joined Lee Day on a public inquiry 
uh, into organs being taken from children, uh, deceased children, without their parents' uh, knowledge or consent. And um, that was based in Liverpool. So I was working in Liverpool for a year. And um, having worked on that uh, inquiry, I came back to London and I was searching around for a firm that did uh, 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 law that was really focused on individuals and really focused on trying to make sure that individuals had equal access to the law. I think many, many years before that, I had thought I'd go off and be a corporate lawyer. But I think having worked on the inquiry, I was absolutely clear when I came back to London that I had to be work. I had to work at a law firm that was focused on on real people and real issues. And Lee Day absolutely ticked that box. And I was lucky enough to get my first position as a uh, paralegal. Uh, Martin actually gave me my first job uh, at Lee Day, and um, I haven't been kicked out yet. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that. And I'd say after all these years, the same things really drive me, they drive my partners and they drive the, the new generation, the people who are speaking to you today. And that is trying to ensure that people are actually able to access justice and um, ensuring that we can put up a good fight against the big corporations, the, the companies. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, there is a feeling, I think it was mentioned earlier by Abby, but there is a feeling of um, being on the right side of the debate, um, almost always. Well, I would say always, wouldn't I? Um, but um, for me, yes, we have fulfilled the promise that I thought the firm had 20 years ago now and continue to do so in new and interesting ways. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Dan, what's your view on that question? Um, well, yeah, for me, it's, it's a similar, it's a similar view, really. I um, have always been, yeah, I mean, my motivation for wanting to go into law is very much um, wanting to sort of address and tackle injustice faced by, by individuals and, and hopefully to give them a voice and, and the ability to, to sort of challenge that um, injustice. So, yeah, there's not, you know, there's not a huge number of firms who sort of match up with that um, ethos and Lido is definitely one that stood out to me um from a yeah very early stage and so I, my focus was very much on trying to get my foot in the door and um and it's definitely not disappointed me um since I've been here and um yeah um as uh, as a lot of others have already said um we do a lot of really really rewarding work and uh, it can be quite quite challenging and um demanding to be involved in at times but it's definitely um yeah always always uh, hugely worthwhile for me Thank you. Yes. Well, I think that is the general feedback I get from colleagues. Um, and it's nice to be able to hear that uh, more formally, I suppose, in, in a Q&A session for potential joiners to the firm. Um, we've had quite a number of questions about uh, inclusion and diversity uh, around different issues. Um, one of the questions, specific questions, is um, in relation to what is the ratio between male and female partners? So 60% um, female. Um, the firm was started by Sarah Lee, and I think uh, it's probably, you know, that uh, idea of having uh, women throughout some of the more senior roles still stands. Um, in relation to um, diversity in, in terms of ethnicity, we've asked, we've been asked specifically what sort of equality drives do we have in place uh, with regard to ethnicity. We do have a newly appointed um, consultant, actually an inclusion consultant, who used to work as a solicitor, well, she left as a partner in our employment team. And her first role for the firm has been um, providing a report for the management board on the ethnicity pay gap. Uh, that was just read by the partnership at the, uh, our most recent annual general meeting. And I'm sure some of the um, recommendations from that report will be made um, available to our colleagues in due course, but it's not yet been discussed at a, um, a management board meeting. Um, I'm sure that will help with the ethnicity pay gap in terms of also we were the first firm, 
that put up our statistics on our website um, as requested by the Law Society. And we do have a five-year plan for ad addressing that. Um, it's not something which is straightforward. You can't snap your fingers and hope everything happens overnight. But I think the firm would say very much that it's committed to uh, reducing the pay gap and to looking at the recommendations that have been made by our inclusion consultant. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to talk about any of the other equality initiatives that we have in place. Jean? Oh. Philippa? Oh, Jean first, perhaps. I'm ha happy to, to, to go, go first, if that's okay, Philippa. Um, just, I was going to mention that one of the issues that we've recognised in the firm is the um, lack of um, uh, solicitors from a Caribbean and African uh, uh, heritage or with African and Caribbean heritage. And, and one of the ways in which we have uh, sought to address that is with the solicitor apprenticeship scheme that we uh, started two years ago now. And that is a way for uh, somebody to become qualified as a solicitor by um, joining the firm and um, working for the firm whilst at the same time completing their um, uh, an LLB and also the final uh, solicitor's examination, which I've totally forgotten the name of right now. Um, uh, and the benefit of that, of course, is that, that those individuals will really become quite immersed in Lee Day, our culture, the work that we uh, specialize in. And then at the end of it, of that six year period, they would be able to uh, be qualified solicitors and hopefully stay on with us. So um, it's one of the ways in which we're seeking to address a problem that we have identified. And I think that that's the point, really, that firms have to be um, uh, always uh, aware of, of, of their own presence and um, wanting to reflect the society that they uh, uh, live in. And um, I think Lee Day are trying to do that in a variety of ways. Um, Philippa, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jean. Um, I, I'll speak from sort of the LGBT plus perspective. Um, at, at the firm, you know, we do recognise that in lots of firms, actually, there's huge barriers to LGBT plus people being able to be out at work. Um, and we're striving really hard to make sure that Lee Day isn't that. Um, I know that from personal experience, I think it's a very great place to work. You can see Fran's little pride flag behind her. Um, and we've all got those on our desks. Um, but we, we do have lots of sort of policies that do help to sort of support LGBT plus individuals. We've got a transitioning at work policy. Um, our maternity and paternity leave policies have now been renamed as parental leave. Um, and we're really actively trying to improve that. Um, and I think our work, our efforts have been reflected in our position in the Stonewall top 100 employers for LGBT plus people. And we were recognized for our uh, trans inclusion in that. Um, and we, you know, we always put on events. We've recently done an LGBT plus film festival um, for internal staff. And we're really, you know, it's really visible within the firm. And I think that's really great. So. Thank you both very much. Does anyone else want to add anything? Jean. I wondered if I might just add as well that one of our committees is a, is a disability committee that conducts some really important work in terms of ensuring that, that, that you know, the law is accessible to all and trying to uh, make sure that issues that may affect people with disabilities really do form part of our thought process at the firm at a very high level. So again, another example of what we're trying to do to try to make the firm more inclusive. Hmm. Do any of you sit on the women's committee? Um, Natasha, I have, do you want to talk have, a little bit about the Women in Law pledge? Um, yes, yeah, so I have just recently joined the um, committee and... Uh, I think she's gone, uh, hopefully to return, but... Um, 
we won't wait. I'll, I'll press on. Does anyone else want to add to any of what's been said there about diversity and inclusion, either from their own experience or what they know is going on in the practice? Okay. Um, I've got a completely different question for um, trainees and newly qualified, and that is, um, what do you wish you had known before you started in your post as a trainee? Abby, do you want to kick us off on that? Yeah, I'm just, just trying to think. I think probably the biggest thing would just be how sort of how much to not kind of sit there and worry about something and just to ask questions and even to ask questions on things where you know sometimes you might do something and you do get it right but still ask the question don't just sort of think a few that that was right and kind of don't ask why it's um people are always very happy to sort of explain to you why something was the right way to kind of explain something the right thing to do in a situation and um, you know sort of or why sort of your supervisor would usually be very happy to chat through why they've decided to do a specific thing for example like um i'm trying to think of things recently why um we needed a particular type of expert on a matter so just to ask those questions because you can learn sort of so much more from just sort of probing around things a little bit as you kind of do them rather than just going through the motions of doing the work and so I think it's something I try and make sure I do at a sort of sometimes if I'm go, doing a task I'll sort of jot down questions I have as I go and then when I email the finished task to my supervisor I'll put in my emails sort of also I was just wondering and ask those questions and I sort of I think that's one of the areas where I've learned most about sort of um kind of tactics how people make decisions and which will sort of be good training both as a trainee but also then thinking into once you are an NQ um, and sort of beginning a career as as a solicitor and you start to have to make those decisions yourself. Thank you Abby. don't know if anyone else would like Aisha would you like to contribute to that question? Um, that's a difficult question. I would say um, that one thing that I wish I'd known, I think it's more of a philosophical answer. I just, I think it's knowing that everything's gonna be okay in the end. I think I spent a lot of my training contract worrying about what was next, you know, what seat will I be in next? Um, what jobs will there be at the end of it? But, you know, Lee Day is a really, really supportive firm. You know, I ha we have a lot of great colleagues that you can speak to about issues and concerns. And I just really wish that, you know, I spent a lot of time, a lot of the time being in the moment as opposed to thinking way ahead um, and just make, yeah, I would say my advice to trainees and future trainees is just to enjoy the training and enjoy the time that you have. All your skills are transferable. And like I said earlier in my presentation, do really gear you up for your, um, for your qualification as a solicitor. So yeah, really enjoy it. And, try not to think of too much about what's ahead and, uh, and what's next. Thank you. Anyone else like to add to that? Yeah, I'm ha happy to, sorry, oh, happy to add um, something just, yeah, I think in a similar vein, it's just worth remembering when you, you come in, uh, it's easy to feel under a, an enormous amount of pressure, I think, as a trainee when you first start, um, that you have to, you know, that you're supposed to be coming in as almost sort of the the, the the finished article uh, coming in as someone who's ready to take on uh, take on cases and and call clients and immediately find your feet because you have this sort of short period of time two years as a trainee and, and one year seats and uh, you really want to make the most of it but I think it's really important um, to make the most of it by not yeah not feeling under not trying not to put yourself under too much of that pressure and um, just focusing on, on the basics of making sure that you're coming uh, into work with a positive attitude and trying to learn as much as you possibly can um, uh, every day rather than, um, yeah, putting yourself under pressure, um, which can then sort of build up into um, becoming self-critical when you sort of fall below the high expectations that you're putting on yourself. So uh, I think that's something important to bear in mind as a, as a trainee. 
Well, thank you, Dan. Those are reassuring comments, I think, for people who might be concerned about coming in and what's expected of them. Uh, Itasha, thank you very much for getting back in again. Do, do you want to say what you were going to say before you were? Yeah, I'm sorry about that, everybody. I seem to have just got cut off and I wasn't allowed back in. Um, but yes, I was just going to say that the Women Law, Law Pledge, um, you know, it's created to bring gender equality to the forefront and especially in our profession. Um, it was sort of to enact that positive change and it's something that the firm took part in and um, I'm only sort of new to the Women's Committee but I've joined one of the meetings and I can certainly say it's really empowering, really encouraging and we recently um, had that firm wide photo with all of us supporting it so yeah really really good work and I'm really glad that I, I joined. Okay thank you all very much we've run over a little bit so I think I'm going to be drawing us to a close now. We have had a, a tremendous number of questions, nearly 150, and we haven't been able to deal with every single one of them, I'm afraid. Um, before I sign off for everyone, is there anything that any anybody would like to sort of add or, or give us a final comment to people who are watching and listening and wondering about whether or not to apply to Lee Day? I'll give you all the opportunity to say a little something before we go. Um, I wouldn't mind saying a few words, friend. If that's ahead, okay. Um, I think just to say that um, uh, if you have heard um, the comments that have made uh, that have been made today by by the panel, and, and you think that Lee Day is the firm for you, please do apply. Um, we are looking for um, talent out there, and uh, we recognise that talent comes in a variety of different forms and we will do our best to make sure that we bring you into the firm. It's been said before, but it is absolutely true. We see our partners, uh, sorry, we see our trainees as our future partners. And the reason why we invest so heavily in trainees is because we really think that you will be leading the firm in years to come. So um, don't be scared or put off by anything that you've heard today. Um, if you think that Lee Day is right for you, do apply and um, hopefully, you know, you'll be uh, 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 taken over from me in the partnership as I retire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Anyone else want to give a final comment to potential applicants? No, well, I'll give my, my comment. I mean, I, I will second exactly what Jean said, you know, if you've got an inkling that you want to apply, please go ahead and apply. Uh, if you're not successful this year, follow in Dan's shoes and, and make another application when you've learned a bit more about the practice and uh, perhaps heard some of the questions that you might be asked in interview. Um, just before I finish, I've had two requests to say what is written on the poster behind my head. So I'm just gonna move this way so that everyone can see that it says, work hard and be nice to people. I've also been asked, what does that mean? Um, well, I hope it sort of stands for itself, but uh, I guess that's uh, a kind of mantra. You know, you, you, even if you're under pressure uh, at Lee Day, I think um, all our partners and, and solicitors uh, act in a nice, decent way to each other. And that's the sort of uh, firm that I'd like to think we are, and I believe we are, that um, you've heard quite a lot today about uh, how we've all worked well during COVID and continued supervising and helping our trainees along. And um, you know that sort of mantra is one of the types of things that I would expect people to believe in. So thank you all very much for attending. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure with my panel. Thank you everybody who's contributed. So thank you, I shall sign out to everybody now. <laughs>